I want to talk today on the topic, it's what's inside that counts. It's what's inside that counts. If you have your Bibles and you'd open them with me to 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 21. I read today from the King James text. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then were all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, therefore, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now, then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be, re be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God, in him. Master, we come before the throne of grace once again. And Lord, once again, once again, once again, my spirit is deflated, my heart is broken. Once again, I'm swimming in the murky waters of depression, discouragement, despondency. Because once again, people have proven to fail us. Lord, you may never fail us, but people seldom do otherwise. It is Resurrection Sunday. What day better to be in the house of God than this day? Master, if I'm going to preach the word you placed in my spirit for today, for the benefit of our online members, our many extended members, those who faithfully watch and participate online, and the one who actually gives in support of this ministry, as not a single other person does, I ask God today that the anointing of the Holy Ghost would rest upon me because I am not in a good frame of mind right now. I don't know how anybody could expect Moses to lead Israel and to keep a positive thought and to keep encouraged when the people of Israel kept going off and doing stupid things, saying stupid things, acting foolishly. And yet today, if ever I've identified with Moses, I certainly identify with him today. 
Master, I need the anointing because this message is important to me. I need to hear it. There aren't many preachers I can listen to that don't disgust me with their message of judgment and condemnation and foolishness because they have no concept of the truth of your grace. And therefore, Lord, I need the word that I preach, the word that you deliver to the church through me. I need it in order to encourage my own heart to lift myself up. David, the psalmist said, the word of God declares, David encouraged himself. And it's listening to the word that you give me each week, Lord, that helps to encourage me. I need it. Anoint me today for the benefit of those who are listening, those who are watching, by reason of the internet for Tommy and look mostly, Lord, for myself. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. We live in a world today where people treat their bodies as a commodity. They do not value themselves beyond their ability to attract attention. And usually the attention they seek is sexual attention. Sadly, they do not realize that when you present yourself as little more than a piece of meat, you can expect to be treated by those who are attracted to you as nothing more than a piece of meat. Some of the people I have found the most attractive in my life have been those who know how to dress well and look nice. They presented themselves as professional or dignified. They appeared to onlookers as one who had class and distinction. They did not carry themselves according to the dictates of this world. They lived by their own rules. They demonstrated an independence and a dignity that you seldom see in most folks today. I knew a transgender gal in Connecticut some years back. I've talked about her to some of you that know me personally. She was very heavy. She was stocky, not enormous, but really a good-sized girl. And every single time I saw her, every single time I saw her, she looked pretty. She looked nice. Guess what? You never saw her cleavage. She never wore skirts so high that another millimeter and there'd be no more secret for Victoria to keep. No, she wore fairly conservative clothing, but she always looked impeccable. She always looked so nice. And by the way, she did not perform she was not a drag queen. She was transgender. Therefore, she did not perform. She lived this. But every time I saw her, I was so taken by her. I told her one time, I said, you know, I, I've not seen anybody in the last only God knows how many years who doesn't treat their body like it's a sex snack and they're constantly trying to appeal to some horn dog who's out there hunting for somebody to lay down with 
No. She knew her build. She knew her structure. She knew how to accentuate the positive and kind of pull your attention away from attributes that maybe weren't quite as positive. And I'm telling you, I kid you not, you never saw a person who looked more attractive every single time you saw her. I know when I went to school as a teenager, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me as I was going into high school. And He told me, I used to love to wear ties. So going to church on Sunday was something I loved because I'd always put on a certain tie to go to church. Our church didn't ask you to do that. It wasn't a requirement. A lot of the men did back then. There was this thing about reverencing God and showing respect to the Lord. People weren't in the habit of going to church back then in Daisy Dukes and flip flops and tank tops. No, they tried their best to show reverence and respect for God when they went to the house of the Lord. And I used to love to wear ties on Sunday to church, but the Lord spoke to me, I'll never forget it, and said, as you go into high school, He said, I want you to wear a tie to school. Every day, I thought, wear a tie to school every day. Why in the world would the Lord want me to wear a tie to school every day? A lot of the boys, even back in the 70s and early 80s, you know, they used to love to wear their shirts unbuttoned down to their belly button. You remember? You remember the little Italian horn necklaces that uh, a lot of the fellas used to wear? They'd let that rest on their chest in the bed of hair, which I did not have. Oh no, even then we had folks trying their best to be sexy, to look physically appealing and sexually desirable. And here the Lord was telling me, I want you to wear a tie to school. So I did. And what I found was my wearing a tie to school caused me to stand out from the crowd. It distinguished me. Everybody in the school knew who I was. Now, I didn't wear it for that reason. When the Lord told me to wear it, I didn't even know why He told me to wear it. But everybody in that school knew me. Many people referred to me back then as Thai guy. He's the Thai guy. But many, many students referred to me as Rev. That was my nickname, Rev. They knew that I was called to preach and I was going to be a preacher. I used to get calls from students, folks who were suicidal, and they would call me at my parents' house and I would try to help them. I had kids in school pull me aside in the hallway and confess things to me that they were struggling with hardships they were going through one young lady one one day i was headed to my last class for the day and one young lady pulled me aside and she said charles can i talk to you i really need to talk to you. i said okay one of the classrooms was empty so we went into the empty classroom and she started talking to me she had become pregnant and was terrified didn't know what she was going to do didn't know how she was going to tell her family, her parents. I comforted her. She was in tears. I comforted her the best I could. I spent the entire period talking to her and comforting her. And I promised her, I said, I'll come to your house. And when you talk to mom and dad, I'll be there with you. Now, I obviously wasn't the dad of this baby, but I was going to be there for her. And she was so encouraged by my making that offer to her. And then the period 
had pretty much come to an end and we parted company. I went to my art class. I went in and I told my art teacher what had happened. I said, I'm sorry. I said, well, a student pulled me aside and she was going through something very traumatic and terrible. I said, I'm sorry I missed it. I never skipped a class a day in my life. So that was not something common for me to do. She said, well, you don't skip my class. Now, she was an old crabby thing. An art class, mind you. She said, you need to go see Mr. Miller, the principal. The high school principal. So I went to Mr. Miller's office. And I went in shirt and tie. And I sat down in front of him and he said, well, Mr. Morrow, what's wrong? What happened? And I began to explain it to him. And I said, I cannot break her confidence. I said, but one of our female students is pregnant and she's terrified. And she stopped me in the hallway. I've known her for years. She pulled me aside. I said, I went into an empty classroom and tried to comfort her and encourage her. I told her I would go with her when she spoke to her mom and dad and so on and so forth. And Mr. Miller said to me, Mr. Morrow, the students at this school respect you as though you were a member of the faculty here. He said, I know that for a fact. He said, I have heard students calling you and leaning on you going through some very difficult times and I've heard reports of how you helped them and you encouraged them and you may have kept some people alive that otherwise would have committed suicide. He said, any time you ever need to do what you did today, he said, you do it. He said, and afterwards, don't go to your classroom. You just come straight to me and I'll make sure your, your uh, uh, absence is excused. You see, you don't always have to follow the crowds. You don't always have to do things the way everybody else does things. You don't have to live your life by the secular mandates and rules of secular society. No, there is nothing wrong with walking your own path and doing your own thing. You never know how you're being different can make you something special. Hallelujah. like that young transgendered woman that I knew. I actually found myself attracted to her. Yes, I found her incredibly attractive. There was something about the way she carried herself. There was something about her willingness to do things her way and not simply the way the majority did things. She was sweet, she was quiet, she was pleasant, she was intelligent, she was funny, and my friend, she was fun and a pleasure to be around. Sometimes some folks understand this important truth, and the truth I speak of today is this, it's what's inside that counts. You can dress up the outside and look as hot as you want to look and still be a stench of a person. I've met more people who were gorgeous to the eye and three minutes into conversation, I was ready to run for the nearest door. They were a bore, they were ignorant, 
They were not very smart. They had no sense of humor. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? You ever done that, you know? Met somebody and thought, boy, they sure are pretty. And then their mouth opens. And two minutes later, you're thinking, dear God, how did I get myself into this mess? Well, I'll tell you, the older you get, the more you begin to appreciate it's what's inside that counts. You can have all the appearances in the world of youth and beauty and sex appeal, and yet on the inside you offer nothing past that. If that's all you have to offer, folks, that's all people are going to use you for. And then young people wonder why. Why do all these men use me and throw me away like yesterday's trash? Well, could it be because you present yourself as trash? Oh, Lord. Pastor, you're not supposed to preach messages like this. Well, you're sounding too mainstream. Honey, it's not mainstream. It's the Word of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, the word of the Lord declares, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. The term godliness here meaning all that pertains to God. He said, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. All people saw when they looked at Jesus Christ was a man who hailed from a small village called Nazareth. He was God in a human body, and yet most saw nothing more than a man. In a conversation Nathaniel had with his brother who was wanting to introduce him to Jesus, John chapter 1 verse 46, and Nathaniel said unto him, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? <laughs> said, what on earth can come out of Nazareth that would impress me? What on earth would come? How many people in Dallas today? I lived in Dallas 20 years, never saw a city as pretentious in my life as Dallas, Texas. Can any good thing come out of Pleasant Grove? Can any good thing come out of South Dallas? Hello now. If you know Dallas, then you understand I've just named two neighborhoods that don't have necessarily the best of reputations. That's where Jesus hailed from. A little town of Nazareth didn't, uh, didn't amount to a whole lot of nothing. Nobody famous hailed from Nazareth. Nothing great ever came out of Nazareth. So why in the world should I suspect today that anything should come out of Nazareth? Well, maybe you might consider that biblical prophecy said Messiah would be called a Nazarene. Hallelujah. So the fact he hailed from Nazareth helped to identify him as the biblical Messiah. But all people saw is what they saw with their naked eye. In Isaiah 53 and verse 2, a prophecy concerning Messiah said this, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of the dry ground. 
He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. According to the prophet Isaiah, Jesus the Messiah would be a very average, if not homely, man. All these pictures you see of this handsome Jesus, you know, oh, with that long flowing hair and that beautifully trimmed beard and those blue eyes. Honey, he looked nothing at all like that. Nothing at all. Isaiah said there is no beauty that we should desire him. God didn't want people following him because he was pretty. He wanted people following him because they could see beyond the external and see something unique and special within. Hallelujah. Because sometimes it's what's on the inside that counts. Most could not see past the external appearance. Biblical prophecy said he would not be handsome or striking as a man. God didn't want people following him because he was physically attractive. He wanted people to follow him because they saw something more in him than that which they could see externally. And yet he is most often pictured as a striking man, a handsome man, and physically attractive. Human beings are limited in our abilities to only be capable of seeing the outside of the human form. We cannot see as God sees. And the Lord sees the heart of man and has little interest in the outward appearance. 1 Samuel 16, 6 and 7, And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance. But the Lord looketh on the heart. As the prophet Samuel inspected the sons of a man named Jesse. Having been instructed to anoint a new king to reign over Israel from among the sons of Jesse. Jesse was little more than a small rancher living in one of the smallest hamlets in all of Israel. He was not a rich man, nor was he powerful or influential. He was not a man of politics nor even an aristocrat. But in this humble home, a son was residing whom God had chosen to succeed Saul as king over Israel. As Samuel met each of Jesse's sons, he was impressed by their stature, their physiques, and their comeliness. Yet as he met each and every son of Jesse, he heard the Lord whispering in his ear, No, this is not the one. Finally, having seen all of Jesse's sons, or at least he thought all of Jesse's sons, he asked Jesse if he had yet another Young David was called from the field where he was tending his father's sheep. A young, small boy with a ruddy appearance and little cause to appear a potential king slowly made his way to the place where Samuel stood waiting. 
And as he came, the Spirit of the Lord said, Yes, this is my choice. You know, I've questioned, I don't know how many times, why on earth God ever chose me to call me to preach? I'll never understand it. As long as I live, there's a million men out there far better qualified than I am. There are people who could put up with the garbage and the foolishness that I go through every day that, that would handle it a whole lot better than I can. I don't know why He called me. I many times have told the Lord He made a major mistake. Most preachers come from preachers' homes. Daddy was a preacher. Granddaddy was a preacher. Oh, there's this sacred lineage that so many preachers come from. My father was a godless heathen, an abusive narcissist. I had no lineage to speak of still don't understand how God ever called me to preach. I still never understand why at the age of eight I sit on the pew of my church as a child sitting there listening to the service, watching the pastor admonish and exhort the congregation only to suddenly have the entire room go silent. I looked around. I'm still seeing people's lips moving. I'm still seeing people clap their hands. It's clear to me that people are still making noise, but somehow I am hearing nothing. It is dead silent. And then from that silence, I heard a voice, not quite whispered, just a a little above a whisper say as clearly to me as could be clear. That's what I want you to do. Somehow instinctively, I knew I was hearing from the Lord. But I didn't quite understand what he meant. I said, what Lord? What do you want me to do? And then the voice said, I want you to preach. And as soon as he had said that, the sound came back up in the congregation. It was like he had turned the volume off and then turned it back on again. And I was right back in the service. And I literally sat there, eight years old, dumbfounded. What just happened? But God doesn't see as men see. There are a lot of preachers look at me and because I don't have a daddy and a granddaddy and a great granddaddy who've been preaching in a certain movement, they look at me like I'm worthless, like I have no value in the church whatsoever. But somehow, some way, God saw something in me that he felt he could use. Sometimes we look at ourselves and we see little that we feel is impressive or attractive. Most normal people suffer from lack of self-esteem. It is actually the unusual individual who is brimming with self-confidence and who thinks so well of themselves that compliments are met with little more than, but of course. We tend to judge ourselves by the way in which we present. We try to look at ourselves through the eyes of others. And it is through this lens we judge our own attractiveness our own worthiness, our ability to impress or influence others. But the truth remains, it's what's on the inside that counts. 
people who carry themselves with confidence and good humor are far more attractive than one who is attractive externally but cocky, self-centered, and vain. In 1 Peter 3, 2 and 3, the Apostle Peter instructs women not to be obsessed with trying to decorate themselves with jewels, gold, and ornate hairstyles, but rather to adorn themselves with a meek and quiet spirit, which Peter said was precious and valuable in the sight of God. As believers, we ought to live our lives in such a manner as to allow our inner man to shine through, unobscured by external accoutrement, which limits the observer's view of our inward man by drawing their attention to the outward man instead. While most could not see beyond the average looks of the man Jesus Christ, there was something within him which made him a unique treasure among men. Within that simple, humble human form beat the heart of the creator of the universe. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, as well as, ver, excuse me, 1 in, yeah, 1 through 3, as well as verse 10. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Verse 10, He was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not. The Father and the Son were one and the same. But the Father had disguised himself as one of us so that he might do for us what we could not do for ourselves. He had come to provide himself as the sacrifice for the sins of the world. And because he was in fact God Almighty, his sacrifice would be sufficient to pay the debt for every human being ever born, from Adam to the last child to ever be born, as we reach the finish line of this present age. Most, however, could not see the Father within the man Jesus, but he was there. John chapter 14, verses 6 through 11. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. 
In John chapter 10 verse 30, Jesus made this clear declaration. I and my Father are one. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end listen upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this who is this Messiah? Well, he is to be called Wonderful. He is to be called Counselor. My friend, he is also called the Mighty God. He is also called the Everlasting Father. Because sometimes it's what's inside that counts. Our primary text today declares to wit, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Messiah is to be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And he will sit upon the throne of David. In Psalm 132 verse 11, we read this prophetic word. The Lord hath sworn in truth unto David. He will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. There was a lot more to Jesus than met the eye. In our primary text today, the Apostle Paul declared in 1 Corinthians 5.19, once again to wit that God was in Christ, was in Christ, was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. The body of the man Jesus Christ was a vessel through which our God was able to demonstrate his love for us in a way that we could understand. Human beings understand the notion of one being so much in love that they willingly lay down their life for the one they love. Manifesting himself in human form, the Creator was able to demonstrate his love for his creation in the most potent and powerful way possible. But, being God within, it was impossible for death to retain its hold on the body of the man Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 2 verses 22 through 24, ye men of Israel, Peter said, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death. Listen, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. <laughs> his identity made it impossible for death to hold him. 
Today we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. For those of us who walk in Revelation, we do so knowing that the Spirit of God in Christ was the means whereby our Savior arose. He was not restored to life by an external source, but rather an internal one. When His Spirit reunited with His body, God in Christ, hallelujah, stood up, folded his grave clothes neatly and laid them at the head of what had been his stone bed and walked out of that tomb. Hallelujah! He wasn't in a hurry. In Romans chapter 8, verses 8 through 15, my final passage for this afternoon. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The word of the Lord tells us that the first Adam was made a living soul, listen, and the second Adam was made a quickening soul. Spirit. What does quickening mean? means it brings life. Jesus came in the flesh full of the Spirit of God. Thus God manifest in human form. Unique in human history. No other human being would ever be a fusion of God and man as was Jesus. But he died and he rose again by the power of that Spirit of God within him, listen, so that he might then put his Spirit in us. So that the same exact way he rose from the dead on resurrection morning, we might rise from the dead at the moment of the rapture or at the time of the resurrection of the saints. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's what's inside that counts. God's plan of salvation includes the promise that all who believe and obey His gospel will also be filled with His Spirit. The same Spirit that caused the Lord Jesus Christ to rise from the dead, if abiding within us, will also allow for us to be raised from the dead on that glorious day of resurrection and redemption. Insomuch as salvation came to us 
by reason of who Jesus Christ was on the inside, so too we will be caught up together with the Lord one day by reason of that same identical operation of His Spirit. Oh, children of God, I want you to know this, this Resurrection Sunday, it's what's inside that counts. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Let's go.